Hello and welcome to EMS Research with Professor Bram, where we talk about the research-related issues that matter to those who work in emergency medical services. Today, we'll be talking about how long EMS stays on scene after CPR resuscitation. Welcome to the EMS Research Vlog and Podcast from the studio here in Houston, Texas. I'm your host, Bram Duffy. I'm a full-time paramedic on the street, like many of you. I also have an appointment as a research fellow with the Institute for Social Innovation at Fielding Graduate University, and I'm an assistant professor of communication at Kennesaw State University. I actually have a research study open now for first responders, so if you don't mind being interviewed by me, then go to my website and check it out, www.professorbram.com. It's professorbram.com. You just click on the current research tab to apply. The other thing to share before we get started, I have written two different books on communication. And the most recent book was just released called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can find a link to the book below. Also, for sure, hang out to the end and I'll tell you more about it. So today we're lucky because I have Jacob Hutton here that I'd like to introduce. Jake is a paramedic from Canada who's a PhD candidate in epidemiology and data science. He's a graduate researcher at the BC Resuscitation Research Collaborative, and that's focused on developing biosensors for cardiac arrest detection, as well as surveillance epidemiology for the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and EMS system performance. He's really interested in, in how applied data science and technology can be used to make medicine and healthcare systems more proactive. And so he's focusing on ways to use these smart technologies to improve the response time to health emergencies like cardiac arrest and deal with things like opioid overdose and trauma. He believes that by combining the human intelligence with advanced analytics, that we can make healthcare systems more efficient and effective. So today he's here to talk about his research. And so Jacob, welcome to the show. Tell me about yourself. Is there anything I missed? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think you got to most of the important parts there. As you mentioned, I am a paramedic. I'm based out of uh, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and uh, I've been a paramedic uh, for about five years and a couple years into being a paramedic, I got interested in research and sort of went down the, the research pathway. And that's brought me to to where I am now. Still work on ambulance a couple of shifts a week. So it's uh, that's always a challenge finding that balance. But uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about uh, sort of, as you mentioned, uh, system performance and technology in, in emergency medical services. And uh, in addition to sort of the intro you had there, I'm an, I should mention I'm an avid first aid trainer. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, traveling all through uh, Western Canada, uh, teaching emergency care to our mountain search and rescue teams. And so that's something I spent a lot of time on as well. Uh, and then my free time, I should also just uh, put it out there that I do live in British Columbia. So of course, I'm an avid skier and mountain biker. So for all my skiers and mountain bikers out there, there's lots to do in BC if you ever make it up here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, I've been to Vancouver three times, I think. And the most recent time that I was in Vancouver, it was um, because uh, my brother, his name's Todd Duffy. He's a professional fighter. So he was there uh, at a, you know, uh, fighting at a professional fight in Vancouver. So maybe you could have been the paramedic that helped out, you know, my brother <laughs> after, after, you know, the, the fight, but um, cause that's some, that's some pretty brutal stuff, but gosh, you're in a beautiful part of the country. And I just have something funny to mention, you know, being from the United States, we have different squirrels than y'all do. And I know it sounds like a, a weird thing to say, but there are no black squirrels in the United States. As far as I know, I went to Vancouver. I'm like, they're everywhere. This is so cool. Interesting. Did you yeah, know that you were the only black squirrel place? That <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't know much about squirrels generally, but uh, that's the sort of uh, tidbit of information I will not forget, and I'll I'll use it as my own moving forward. So well, that was my experience. I thought it was pretty cool. So yeah. congratulations big time on this publication. The Journal of Resuscitation is one of the most prestigious journals in the world. And so the article that caught my eye that you put out is called The Association of Post-Resuscitation On-Scene Interval and Patient Outcomes for um, after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. I wanted to break this down because there is a lot of 
different methods for how do we handle the resuscitation timeline. And sometimes they're based on the individual paramedics uh, experience. And sometimes it's based on the agency, right? The agency might say, Hey, you know, after ROSC, we do an immediate, you know, X, Y, Z, or, you know, so there are different nuances to this. And so that's why I'm excited about this kind of study work done because it changes it from just being a style into like, Oh, well, what's the real evidence show. So some background on your article, you know, after the heartbeat returns during CPR and we get ROSC, it's not always clear how long paramedics uh, should stay on scene before taking them to the hospitals. And so the researchers looked at cases in British Columbia where paramedics treated adults for CPR in the pre-hospital from like 2019 through 2021. And they especially focused on cases where the heartbeat returned before the patient was taken to the hospital, right? So you got Ross back and then transported. And they wanted to see if the amount of time the paramedics spent with these patients before transport affected their health outcomes. So let's check out what they found. So out of 1,653 cases, 611 people survived until they were discharged from the hospital, and 523 had good brain function when they left the hospital. So on average, paramedics spent about 19 minutes with their patients after their heartbeat returned, but before they were taken to the hospital. So when they compared these times, they didn't find that speculating more time with the patient improved their brain function, but they did find that spending uh, more time did improve the chances of them surviving until they could leave the hospital. It was a really interesting finding. So when we spend more time with a patient after the heart's been restarted, it doesn't necessarily help their brain function, but it does seem to help them survive until they can leave the hospital and reduce the chances of their heart stopping again on the way to the hospital. So Jake, gosh, can you tell us a little bit more about the, about your background and what led you to this and just help dig into this article with me. Yeah, uh, for sure. So, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a paramedic and uh, so we deal with, with cardiac arrest and uh, certainly cardiac arrest is, is the most life-threatening and time sensitive uh, condition that, that paramedics respond to on, on a regular basis. And, uh, and so that's a very interesting field of research. And uh, I think just, I think most paramedics you speak to will, will have an interest in hearing about better ways to deal with cardiac arrest just because the, the survival is so low uh, from out of hospital cardiac arrest. And so, uh, you know, primarily I'm a cardiac arrest researcher and I, I focus on cardiac arrest um, with regards to trying to find it uh, quicker when it occurs uh, and then respond to it more effectively with a well-functioning system. And so in British Columbia, which is our province, equivalent to a state in the U.S., we've got really, really great data on cardiac arrest. We, we have a provincial registry that captures all cases that receive treatment from EMS. Uh, and I think, you know, working as a paramedic, you see the gaps in health systems and health services. And, uh, you know, th this is one of those gaps, you know, we, we focus so much on, on what to do when the patient's in cardiac arrest, patient comes back, what now, right? And, and for, for many years, we've, we've kind of had a scoop and run mentality. I think that's pretty consistent across North America in, in cardiac arrest and trauma as well. But we're starting to break that apart and to, and to try and get a little bit more evidence-based uh, with, with, you know, maybe with some cases we don't scoop and run, or maybe here, here's kind of the, the benefit of, of maybe not scooping and running uh, in certain situations. And so this was sort of the question that guided this research. And it makes me think about all the different things that happen between the time we get ROSC and the time the ambulance wheels start moving. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, normally, as soon as I get ROSC, I'm making sure that I have an antiarrhythmic on board if needed, and I get something up there for blood pressure support, right? So get those things going. And then by gosh, if I haven't had time to intubate by now, I need to probably go ahead and knock that out of the way before I get out the door. So some of this is like housekeeping stuff, but it's like, when do these things happen? And, and from my perspective, I'm thinking, you know, we have the patient in, a, in an environment where all of our equipment is laid out around them. All of our stuff is ready to go. It didn't start out that way, right? But we, you know, we, we got to this position. So to what level do we um, stabilize before moving away from, you know, that uh, easy to access equipment again? And that's usually what I do. I'm like, okay, do we enter rhythmic airway and um, blood pressure support? 
are there more things that I'm missing that that uh, are really thought of during that time? No, no, I think that's that's sort of the that's sort of the idea. It's it's the balance between um, optimizing and stabilizing on scene prior to transport. So certainly uh, the the advanced life support uh, interventions that are required, they take time. Uh, and and so, you know, we're interested in understanding the benefit and the harm of that extra time on scene. The, the only other thing that I that I have thought about and, you know, it's something that we talked about when we did this analysis, but we couldn't really find a, a great way to parse it out was the idea of the the actual nature of the transport from the scene to the ambulance. And, you know, in in our city in Vancouver, we have a lot of older buildings with steep staircases and there's not a lot of access to the patient, they're narrow. And so is there some benefit to, to stabilizing and packaging well in a way that the patient can be monitored and what resuscitation is needed can be continued during transport to the ambulance? Um, you know, getting out of a narrow hallway or narrow stairway in an apartment building. Um, so so that that's the other thing. Getting ready for a complex extrication is another thing that you could be doing during that post rosc interval. I'm also thinking about this is the time I normally uh, hand over, like if I'm the lead on the call, I'll normally hand over to a second paramedic to continue while I go back and do an interview with the family, right? So I might have not have had an opportunity to do a, a thorough interview that might that might be a helpful thing too. And yeah. in general, I just think that there's like these different mindsets, you know, one mindset is, oh my gosh, let's get our butt to the hospital. And, and the other mindset is, do we need to, to dot any I's or cross T's? So the yeah. research team, uh, how, how did you guys go about conducting this? Did you go through uh, patient reports or how did this come about? Yeah, so we have a, uh, we have a registry, right? So we have a, it's an observational data set. It contains uh, info on all of the cardiac arrests in our province. So that, that's really an amazing uh, piece of data. Uh, we have about 5 million residents in our province. And on a yearly basis, we'll have something around that six 7,000 out of hospital cardiac arrests that receive treatment from EMS. I hope I'm getting that number right. So, something like that. And so, the, so we have data that comes from the paramedic electronic uh, patient care record, uh, and so we can access that that record, and we can we can take samples from that data, and we can use it to to answer observational questions like this. So, um, in this study, we looked at eighteen months of data uh, from January first, twenty nineteen, to June first, twenty twenty one. Uh, and we we included adults only who had received resuscitation and then regained return of spontaneous circulation. So they have a pulse now uh, and then had been transported to hospital. Uh, and so then we called that interval between the return of spontaneous circulation and starting of the conveyance to hospital, the, the post resuscitation on scene interval. Right. That's what we've been talking about. And our, our primary question was, okay, how does the length of this post-resuscitation on-scene interval relate to the likelihood of surviving to hospital discharge with a good neurological outcome? Uh, and so that that's defined using a, a standard score. It's called the cerebral performance category score. That's a common measure in, in cardiac arrest research. And we also looked at two other secondary outcomes. The first secondary outcome was just survival only, which is sort of a, that's like a wider net, right? Um, and then we also looked at the risk of having a subsequent cardiac arrest uh, during transport to hospital. It just yeah. sparked me into thinking about like the all of the different uh, attributes that could trigger a different result, right? Because there just are so many things that happen on these cases. It makes me excited to think about drilling down for each one of them, right? I guess like one of them was, you know, do we need to secure the airway, right? And because has it been done yet or not? Or and, and so to, to pull this off, maybe a way to look down deeper would be to have a uh, like a survey questionnaire that gets filled out after every CPR, right? And then then we could, you know, find out more about um, some of these things that uh, that might take effect. It's just exciting. I don't know. Tell me more about your your thoughts where you're at with this. For sure, right? Like that, and that's that's sort of how we do observational research. Like first of all, we have the question, then we then we have the data. And then we look, we just look um, just generally 
uh, how do the groups look when you break them down by exposure, right? And so the, ex the exposure here is the length of the post-ROSC interval. And so for all patients in the data, we had about 1,600 patients. The, the median, so like the average post-ROSC interval was about 20 minutes, so like 19.8 minutes. Uh, and so then we, we break it down a little further. That, that's the exposure. And then the outcome is neurological function. So when we look at patients who had a good neurological outcome, just in the raw data compared to those with a poor outcome, the length of the interval was pretty similar. It was about 19.8 minutes for those who had a good outcome versus 18.7 for a poor outcome. So that's that's sort of your raw data, right? Um, but as you mentioned, the problem here is that many factors impact both of those things, right? Like age, uh, sex, and treatments. So, so, you know, typically in observational research, you have to figure out a way to adjust for that, right? Um, and so, you know, you might have you might have come across the idea of statistical adjustment or, or regression. And so that's what we did in this paper. We used a, a statistical technique called a logistic regression model to kind of parse that out a little bit more. Um, we broke down the exposure into categories. So we looked at quartiles, right? So quartiles of the post-ROSC interval. Um, and then we adjusted for factors that might affect the relationship between the post-ROSC interval and the outcome. And that included demographic factors, circumstantial factors, and factors related to the EMS response. And so that, that's sort of our way to, to say, okay, we have this exposure, we have this outcome. We know many things can affect both of, like, like they can contribute to covariation in the exposure and outcome. And so can we slice it all up, hold all those covariates equal, uh, and then see what 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 relationship remains. So that that's sort of our methodological approach. So in that third category, how did that get parsed out? Because it was the it was basically situational, right? Yeah. So the the circumstantial uh, those are those are variables like the location type of the cardiac arrest. So whether or not it occurred in a public setting, uh, a private setting, or a mm -hmm. semi-public setting, and those these are things like an outpatient medical facility or a nursing home. Mm -hmm. uh, or industrial site, uh, we we controlled for the first shockable rhythm. Uh, so you know, patients who have a, a shockable rhythm on scene uh, when paramedics arrive, they do better, right? So we we want to hold that constant when we're trying to look at the exposure outcome relationship. Uh, we adjusted for a lot of the intervals with regards to how long it took EMS to come to the scene. So the nine one one to first EMS interval the 911 to first ALS interval, uh, the, the EMS arrival on scene to return of circulation interval. So all these things, right? And, and so what we're trying to do is just uh, eliminate all of the covariation that's not due to the exposure and outcome. And then what we're left with, we can say something about the unconfounded relationship between those variables. Tell me more about what the study found versus what you now are reflecting on and what you think, right? Because as the as the researcher, you have been able to, you know, get all these extra nuances, you know? So give me an idea, like what, what did you find? And then how, what's your reflection on it all? Like, what do you, what do you? Think? For sure. So, so firstly, I should say, this is the type of study where what, what comes out of it is more questions, right? So, and that, that's pretty common in observational research. Like we, we look for associations uh, and then if we find one, we say, okay, hmm, it might be because of this, it might be because of this, and we, we investigate further. And so that, that's sort of what happened in this study. So we, you know, we found, um, firstly, that there was not a significant relationship between the length of the post-ROSC interval and neurological outcome. Uh, it, it wasn't significant. And so we, you know, in, in research, we talk a lot about statistical significance. And usually what we're saying is, um, we we want to to have a lot of confidence in our estimated effect, uh, and if we if we're not confident, the the error interval is is pretty wide, and so we say, well, it's not statistically significant, right? It, it doesn't cross that barrier of of confidence for us. Um, but you can also you can also within that look at the direction of the effect, even if it's not statistically significant, and you can sort of you can make you can make a bit of an inference. 
And so in this study, even though that primary outcome was not significant, the direction of the effect seemed to favor longer intervals when it, when it comes to the um, neurological outcome. So that's the primary analysis. And then in the, in the secondary analyses, we looked, as I mentioned, at uh, survival, and that's just, that's just binary, like did they survive or not to hospital discharge, as well as uh, what were the odds of the patient experiencing a re-arrest during transport to the hospital. And there were some interesting findings there. Um, number one, there was a significant relationship between the longest quartile of the post-ROSC interval, and that was post-ROSC intervals over 25 minutes, uh, and survival to discharge. So patients in that category were 73% more likely to survive to hospital discharge than patients with the smallest post-ROSC interval, and that was zero to 13 minutes. So zero to 13 minutes versus over 25 minutes. Uh, the patients in the over 25 minute category much more likely to survive to discharge. Okay. Uh, there's also a significant relationship between the length of the post ROSC interval and odds of experiencing a subsequent arrest during transport uh, with patients in the longest categories, that's above 25 minutes, 56% less likely to receive, uh, to experience a, another cardiac arrest during transport than patients in the shortest category. So that's interesting. In the primary outcome, we have a non-significant finding, but the direction points a certain way, uh, points to a, pr a protective, like a, a beneficial effect. Uh, in, the in the secondary outcome for survival, we see that there's some relationship between length and survival, especially as the length gets very long. Uh, and in re-arrest, we see that the length of the post rosc interval seems to be protective against uh, having a, a subsequent cardiac arrest during transport. So that, that's nice. We have some convergence across our three outcomes, right? Um, and that, that's very important finding. If we find that the survival with favorable neurological outcome is in a different direction than just outcome, than survival to discharge, that doesn't make any sense. And that's hard to interpret. Um, so what do these findings mean? Uh, I would say that it seems like patients generally do better when paramedics stay on scene for longer intervals prior to initiating transport. So it seems like they do better. Does that mean that that's the cause? Uh, and does that mean that paramedics should start staying on scene for a longer period of time with all patients? It's hard to say, probably not. Uh, so this is an association, not a cause, right? That's very important to, to distinguish between in this sort of research. Uh, and so there's probably some factor or, or many, like a constellation of factors driving this association that, that we haven't measured in this data, right? I mean, we, we try our best to, to, to take the data we have and, and measure everything, but it, it's, it's never quite possible. So there's something driving that association. Um, you know, we, we talked a bit at the beginning of this conversation about what's happening in that interval. And uh, yeah, I think the things we mentioned are, are probably uh, the important factors here. Uh, you know, perhaps paramedics are investing more time in making sure the patient is stable prior to transport. And this is what's driving the association that we see. But based on this analysis, we can't, we can't definitively say that. Um, what we can say is that it seems these results may challenge that old dogma of scoop and run mm -hmm. in post-arrest care uh, and potentially highlighting the benefit of staying on scene a bit, optimizing interventions prior to transport. Uh, and I think further work on this topic could definitely be done. It would definitely be helpful to, to look at parsing this out a bit more to understand what's driving that association. Um, and can we come up with maybe a, a bundle of post-ROSC care um, that we can implement uh, maybe in a prospective uh, intervention and, and see if that actually has a causative uh, influence on the outcomes that we want to look at. This opens the door for lots of different assumptions and inferences, and right? And so one of the things I kicked out there already was the thought that, okay, we have pushed off intubation is a less important thing that we don't um, that we don't see as a priority maybe until we have time. So the time that we have time might be at that ROSC state. The other thing is that um, maybe the H's and T's didn't get figured out, uh -huh. you know, because they were in reactionary mode. It was a pretty short arrest and 
um i'm just you know trying to rack my brain for thinking about like what do we do during that time period and um so what uh even though it's not scientific what what are the assumptions that this gives you what what, what are the things that you think eh, it's probably this and that or what, what, what yeah what how do you read into it well i think i i have the same uh luxury as you do of being a paramedic as well as a researcher so i can sort of take my researcher hat off and put the paramedic hat on and sort of make speculations here and i do think what you're saying like i i agree um i think it's it's about like i i've seen on scene patients tend to do better when we take our time and do things well right uh and a lot of these interventions are not binary interventions like securing an airway is uh difficult and it needs to be confirmed it needs to be done properly yeah, it needs to be done in a calm setting uh and so i could absolutely see um on a general level uh if we're taking more time to make sure that's done correctly uh then then i would buy that we're having more patent airways you know i think that makes sense uh then hemodynamic support as well and taking the time to uh to ensure that the patient's uh, hemodynamics are, are fairly stable uh, in the post-ROSC interval. I think that that is also certainly something that could contribute, especially when you look at the, I, I'm quite glad that we included re-arrest in this study as a secondary outcome, mm -hmm. because that speaks a lot to this sort of cardiac stability and the, and, you know, pushing anti-arrhythmics anti uh, post-ROSC. Uh, and so I, I think it's all these things. Um, and I think any paramedic that deals with these cases would, would would be able to kind of visualize, you know, this this in this period of time, right? You've got Ross back. Everyone goes, okay, you know, what now, right? What what's the priority? Um, but I think for me, the question moving forward that I don't have an answer to is like I like I know all of these things are important, but what's the is is there one or two things that are much more important than the other things? Uh, or is it all of them together, um, plus this kind of unmeasurable sense of taking our time um, that that actually contributes to these patients seeming to do a bit better? So um, I'm not sure, but uh, I think that those are great questions for future research, which is something you always say at the end of observational papers. Yeah. So are you uh, doing more work in towards this direction? Because I didn't ask before, but Maybe you could give our audience a brief overview of the uh, the BC Recitation Research Collaborative. You know, what you know, what kind of things yeah. you're doing there? Yeah, sure. We um, are an inter. We're based out of the Faculty of Medicine at, at UBC. That's the University of British Columbia, and BC Resurrect is an interdisciplinary group. Um, it's composed of first responders. Uh, so we've got paramedics on our team. Uh, we have clinicians on our team. We have engineers uh, on our team and, and sort of scientists, statisticians as well. And uh, we do a lot of observational work, uh, observational research on our cardiac arrest registry, uh, looking at primarily questions like this. Like we do a lot of this sort of performance stuff, right? Um, and uh, and sort of resuscitation decision making research as well, uh, and so that that's kind of the function of our observational research. Uh, and then in in sort of parallel with that, we also work on um, technology for out of hospital cardiac arrest, and we have a, a an effort that's been going on for several years to develop and validate and implement. Uh, technology solutions for increasing the detection of cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. If you want to Im improve survival from cardiac arrest, the, the number one place to start is making sure that we detect more cardiac arrests. You know, 75% uh, of cardiac arrests are unwitnessed. And, uh, you know, in the unwitnessed group, the majority don't even receive treatment from EMS. And so if we're just able to, to have more cases be recognized at the time of occurrence, um, we could probably dramatically improve survival. So we've been working on that front as well. So well, it's a the first thought I have is how cool it is that some of these watches can detect atrial fib and VTAC and, you know, and so if yeah. a watch can do that, then 
maybe that's an answer for the for the future right yeah definitely and and so that that that's what we do right um the challenge with the watches is, is that it's hard to get patients in cardiac arrest right it's hard to like find them prospectively right uh and and you need to do that if you want to to build a, an algorithm to to run on a watch um or a ring like a ring's another really good form mm -hmm. factor for cardiac arrest detection uh, and so we, that that's the work that we're doing. We're trying to take these existing technologies and uh, re-engineer them and validate them uh, to to work for cardiac arrest detection. And uh, we're we're right now working with um, cardiac arrest patients and and getting data from them prospectively to to help train our algorithms. So I didn't ask you this before at all. So let me just. Uh, but I'm curious, I'm going to hit you with this question. Do you do any work, or does anyone on your team do any work with uh, the Lucas device or any of those automatic CPR machine studies? Yeah, we uh, we had a few um, uh, surrounding the implementation of an ECMO program mm -hmm. uh, in downtown Vancouver, and uh, the Lucas device was, was part of that um, protocol, uh, out-of-hospital um, enrolled out of hospital case would be enrolled for eligibility in the ECMO study, mm -hmm. and uh, they they would receive the the Lucas during transport, right? Because I I don't know how it works down where you are, but we for the most part we don't transport cases that are in cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. But uh, for your refractory case uh, that seems to fit the criteria for ECMO, um, that that was an inclusion, uh, and and so transporting that case would be done with the Lucas device while they're in active cardiac arrest. Um, so yeah, I haven't looked at, uh, I haven't looked at any of those studies. So uh, myself in the U S we do frequently transport with CPR in progress, but, um, I think that, uh, th that's also depends on the system because some, um, medical directors are more comfortable with, you know, pushing the envelope with field terminations versus mm -hmm. others. But when it comes to this Lucas device, I guess the reason I mentioned it is because my personal, you know, how everyone has their own experience, right? And my experience with Lucas device is that they work, they work well. And I, and, and I see this machine and I think, you know, that, that this is a, this, this could almost save the world, you know, because I've seen it just have such good success. And um, at the same time, I had the opportunity to be in a position to see a lot of, um, a lot of CPR cases with Lucas. And then I read the studies on what I can find about it. And really it, the, the everything that I've read shows that these automatic CPR machines don't necessarily help or hurt. It's just kind mm -hmm. of like a neutral and it blows my mind. Cause I say, from my perspective, this is the, you know, this is the savior. So that's why I wanted to ask about. Yeah, uh, is it, is it, I, I, that, I think two, two things on that. Um, so the first, the first one is like, one of the things about cardiac arrest research is that a lot of the time the, like mo most people don't survive cardiac arrest. Right. So, um, you're already dealing with an outcome that's uh, fairly rare, and so when you have a when you have an intervention that makes sense that it that it helps the case, and you've observed that, um, then I think that's that's also an important thing to to think about, um, even in the face of a non statistically significant study, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's difficult to improve survival from cardiac arrest. Um, and it's it's very difficult to demonstrate that statistically. But, you know, I would also say that even if it's true that the Lucas device, you know, doesn't statistically improve survival, you know, when, when we do these large interventional studies, um, there's definitely a benefit that's hard to measure when the Lucas is 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 in action. Right. There, mm -hmm. There's a lot less cognitive load, I think, for the for the responding team. Mm -hmm. And um I think probably I think it seems to me that a place everyone's settled on with these mechanical CPR devices is definitely as an adjunct for transport, they're fantastic, right? And we use we we use the um not the Lucas, but the the, the Zoll product, the Autopulse. Yes. We Autopulse. use that quite commonly in the search and rescue setting in British Columbia. Um, you know, if someone's been uh, dug out of an avalanche and they're they've got a hypothermic cardiac arrest, they need to be transported out of the mountains. Uh, we'll we'll put them on the Zoll Autopulse, and that that that's you know 
that's been great. That's a great product for that specific situation. So what about just hitting with other thoughts? Does your team do any work with chest pressures with any of those studies? Not, not directly. I did, I did see an affiliated, uh, there was some affiliated work um, with one of our PIs being done uh, last year, la last couple of years about um, optimal hand placement uh, in a swine model. Um, trying to trying to optimize the placement of compressions over the left ventricle instead of over the um the aorta which is sort of what what we currently do but i, I think that's still in the swine model um stage yeah. all this stuff is just really exciting what what else is going on that uh, that i haven't thought about that's happening in cpr research well i, I think i think technology is uh is is really starting to make itself known uh like high up the chain of care and and you know i think that we've we're at a place in cardiac arrest research where we've had a lot of um we've had a lot of success in improving survival for treated cases right so you know for for 30 years we've been working on on that and uh we've had a lot of increases in bystander CPR training, and that's resulted in more bystanders doing CPR. So that across North America, that's good. Uh, we have public access to fibrillation programs, and and those seem to work well for patients who, who who get an AED from that program. But the cost effectiveness is is a little bit uncertain. Um, uh, and then down down the chain, like we've got plenty of medical interventions and um, even recovery focused therapies that are. That have, that have done their part to improve quality of life. But I think the ends of the chain of care, and I've talked about the, the American Heart Association chain of survival, the ends is where the innovation is really happening right now. Like that's that's gonna be transformative, I think. Um, there's some fantastic work being done in quality of life after cardiac arrest, which I think is really important. Um, cardiac arrest researchers for, for the, past couple of decades have just focused on survival to hospital discharge and survival with functional neurological outcome. But uh, we haven't really focused on the quality of life post cardiac arrest and how to improve that. Um, so, so that's really important. Uh, and then I think up the chain at the other end, the recognition component uh, is huge. Uh, and that's going to allow us to to, to address maybe even up to 50% of out of hospital cardiac arrest that currently aren't treated at all. Uh, and if we can just move the numbers a little bit in that patient population, it'll have a huge impact because we're talking about such large raw numbers. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what's coming down the pipeline. I've seen a lot of really interesting stuff in personal sized AEDs as well. Um, so AEDs targeted towards the home uh, rather than, you know, out in a mall or, or an airport, mm -hmm. uh, like both, I think are, are good strategies like taken together. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's a, exciting times that, you know, AI machine learning, uh, applied in the ICU setting is also happening, um, to try and distinguish between different phenotypes of post-cardiac arrest state and, and treat it accordingly. So, um, I guess I started off my answer by saying, the ends of the chain of care, but then I talked about everything. So <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah you know, it's a it's an interesting time, I think, in medicine generally right now. And that's one of the things. Like, I, I want to um to just to finish off our interview, I want to kind of give you the floor to talk about whatever you want to talk about. But also, I think that there are some paramedics who are watching the show that are thinking, "Gosh, I love CPR. I love the you know what I do as a paramedic. I never thought about epidemiology as a field. Like, I could." I could research this. I could make the world a better place. So maybe could you speak to those folks that that didn't even think about this as a as a field or a, a, a thing that they could do? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that like that was kind of me at uh, at a certain point. Um, and I think that being a paramedic is a very interesting perspective, and you see things that I I think a lot of other um, health professionals don't see. I think the, the ability to kind of see the patient in the home uh, and then sort of follow them through their, their kind of accessing care and, and hearing from the patient for a long time. Like we spend a lot of time with our patients. Like I live in British Columbia. Some of our transport times are quite far. 
Uh, so there's a lot of time to hear from the patients and you hear about the gaps uh, in care. And I think probably everyone hears about the gaps in, in healthcare, but paramedics really get a chance to see it mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of get that broad perspective. And I think the broad perspective is, is really useful. So, uh, and, and it's really valuable. And so if you're a paramedic, um, try, try to, try to understand the value of that perspective of seeing what works at the patient level in the home when they're not in the hospital, uh, and then identify the gaps too. And, um, you know, try and find areas that where you can kind of bring seemingly disparate fields together, right? And that, I think that's where innovation happens. I think paramedics definitely definitely have a role there. So an epidemiology is a great toolkit for talking about uh, system performance. Uh, it's a good toolkit for talking about uh, whether or not a medical intervention works. Like it's it's kind of a generalist toolkit for just approaching. Uh, medicine and public health in general. Um, and so I think if you're armed with that sort of broad perspective, you see the gaps. Um, if you want to do further education, like epidemiology, data science is a great, great field. It's, it's obviously growing a lot right now, and it, it'll really arm you with the ability to, to kind of unite different fields. Um, like, like we've done, you know, a lot of my work is focused on technology uh, and personalized medicine and cardiac arrest, you know, those are like overlapping fields and it creates a unique opportunity. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's my advice. Like, I think that the problem to avoid is being siloed. Right. Um, and this is a huge issue in healthcare. And I think in a lot of fields, like there's a lot of specialization. Um, so, you know, one of the, one of the best things I've done in the past few that's been super rewarding is collaborating with, like I work with a team of engineers and uh, they see things totally differently, right? And uh, it's it's great. And uh, there's, a, there's a huge value in that cross-domain collaboration and getting out of the EMS bubble, learning uh, new techniques, new perspectives, and then bringing them back, right? So I think that's where a lot of the opportunities are in the future. People who can kind of be generalists use their background uh, to unite different fields and, th and then come up with new opportunities. Your answer kind of spurred another question, which is I was thinking about, gosh, what would be a good suggestion to tell a paramedic to pursue in school for undergrad if they're interested in doing what you do someday? But I guess the answer is that they need to pursue whatever interests them, right? Because they could do an undergrad in a technology field and then do grad school in epidemiology. And then the combination of those two things could be super fruitful for them, right? Or any yeah. maybe they do a psychology undergrad, but that could be used in a different way. So I guess um, it, it comes down to uh, what what's special to that person, huh? Because that'll give them um, the extra leg up to have that extra angle that someone else wouldn't be able to get. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, anytime you can, you know, find something you're passionate about and, and relate it to a problem or a gap that you see based on your experience um, and maybe overlap it with, uh, with a cool new field, new, new methods, new, new technology, um, new approach that's that's where you're gonna you know really differentiate differentiate yourself and uh, you know if you make your field if you kind of unite a couple different fields all of a sudden you know you're an expert right <laughs> you know, yeah. if you, and if if the if the combination is unique enough and then from there you can branch out so so absolutely yeah and I, I would also just put a plug in for methods too um, and I think whether it's psychology or engineering or, or whatever your, your interest is, every field has a strong methodological component mm -hmm. uh, and, and learning about the process of doing good science, asking, like even just defining like the research question uh, and then looking at ways to answer that question in a rigorous and robust way, um, that skill set is useful across every every domain in in our kind of like in really data based uh economy so um statistics is always a good thing to have in the back of your, in your back pocket and any field will will have their own sort of statistics and methods course so yeah to help understand and break things down for sure yeah. 
gosh, Jake, thank you so much from uh, all the way from uh, Vancouver to spend this time with me and uh, in my audience, you've been great. And again, congratulations on your um, publication and resuscitation, the premier, pretty much the premier biggest journal that I could imagine. And uh, so very jealous here, very excited for you there. And uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Thank you, Bram. It was a pleasure. And, and thanks for your your great questions and getting me thinking about the next steps. Now, now this week, I'll have to revisit this paper and uh, continue on to answer some of the questions we've come up with. I want to also invite you to check out my latest book I co-authored with Four Arrows, who has two doctorates and is an expert on Indigenous scholarship and hypnosis. So I just want to invite you to check it out because we introduce a method for communicating with patients on the scene of an emergency that takes advantage of some of the properties found in hypnosis. This book works to change the way we approach and interact with any kind of emergency patient in acute distress because it's going to help you be a better practitioner and use communication as a healing tool. Right now, there's just not a lot of training in how to talk to your patient. And if you've been stuck with a patient for any period of time and, and you need to have a conversation, it's awesome to be able to have have a healing conversation. This book is called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can follow the link below to find it, or you can find it literally almost anywhere you type in the name or my name. I had a friend that mailed me a book and wanted an autograph. Don't mail me a bunch of books. Just let me know that you want an autograph for the book, and I'll be happy to send you over a sticker. I have some stickers made that are pretty awesome that I'll send you that you could put in the cover. Hi. I'm Will Chaplow from the International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute. You might know about us because of the literature reviews that we post every month free to for your review on our website at iphmi.com and also publish through GEMS Online Magazine every month. We've been doing them for five years, so now we've accumulated over 240 literature reviews over the past five years. And we've gotten feedback from our audience that said they'd like to have these things as desk references, so they'd had a rapid reference. Well, we've done it. And there are now five volumes of these books, one for each year that we've been publishing them. Uh, this is the latest version, uh, volume five. And as I said, in each of these, there's at least 48 literature reviews. They're all cataloged in the beginning of the book, so you can see um, what the topic area is, what pages those reviews are on, and how you can find them quickly. And again, these are a great reference, whether you're putting a lecture together, uh, working on a paper, uh, studying, whatever it is. This gives you the depth of field of the science that dictates what we do in the field or what we should be doing in the field or why we've changed the way we do things in the field. In any event, as with all of our publications, we've priced these because we want you to be able to have this book. It's only $4.99 in the written, in the copy, the hard copy here. And they're all five of them are available at that price. But you can also get them as eBooks. And they're available as eBooks from Amazon, from uh, Apple, from Barnes & Noble, wherever you get, you get your eBooks for the price of $2.99. So again, we don't do this um, with an aim towards getting wealthy. We do these because we want you guys to be able to have these materials. Relevant information, affordable information, and an access so you can get to it. So if you want the hard copies, go on Amazon, $4.99. Go to your ebook store and you get it for $2.99. If you're in the business, this is the kind of material you want to have around to settle those firehouse arguments or to help you put your materials together. Thanks again. See you all soon. Thanks. The other thing before we close that I want to share is that I'm doing a research project related to first responders who live in the United States. And I could really use your help if you don't mind being interviewed over a video call. So go to my website, fill out the form that's at professorbram.com, professorbram.com. And thank you again for listening. I look forward to sharing more insights with you in this next episode. If you enjoy EMS research, please tell your friends, like, share, and subscribe to help others get the message. And then stay tuned for the credits at the end so you can see the research articles that we talked about in today's episode.